On the line with us, Evan Greer, the campaign director with fightforthefuture.org. Fightforthefuture.org is the website. Uh, Evan is an internationally touring musician and speaker. She writes regularly for The Guardian, Time, and Newsweek. Uh, Evan underscore Greer or Fight for the FTR are the two Twitter handles. Evan, welcome back to the program. Hey, thanks for having me back on, Tom. Thanks for, thanks for joining us. So, uh, news happening in the net neutrality arena. Tell us about this. Yeah, well, there's always something going on uh, when it comes to net neutrality these days. But the latest is that California has now uh, introduced what would become, if it passes, the strongest and most comprehensive net neutrality protections in the United States. So your listeners probably remember back December 14th, the FCC voted to gut uh, basic protections that prevent Internet service providers from slowing down content, blocking, censoring websites, and charging us all extra fees to access content online. Uh, and since then, several states have started uh, considering or introducing legislation to kind of defy the FCC uh, and ensure that uh, Internet providers in those states have to abide by these basic rules of the road in order to do business there. So Washington and Oregon have both passed bills uh, with strong bipartisan support. And now we're seeing something in California that actually even goes a little further than those rules gutted at the FCC uh, by specifically banning a harmful practice called zero rating. And we can go there next if you want, Tom. Sure. Yeah, I'll what is zero rating? Evan, so go zero for rating, it. Sure. So zero rating essentially is when your Internet service provider says you can use content from this website or this company, uh, and it's not going to count against your data. Now, that sounds like a good thing. You're thinking, great, you know, I want to be able to watch Netflix on my phone all day and not have it run up. Uh, you know, the, my monthly data against my monthly data limit. Um, that sounds like a good thing for consumers. But here's the problem. It breaks one of the fundamental principles of net neutrality that's made the Internet such a diverse place where we have so many different viewpoints. And it would lead to the future of the Internet looking more like cable TV, where it's essentially pay to play. This means that, for example, AT&T is already offering uh, that you can use DirecTV on your dev AT&T devices without accounting against your data because they own DirecTV. So what we're going to see is these big telecom companies basically directing us, uh, directing our eyes, directing our attention, directing how we consume information on the Internet toward players that pay them money and away from uh, places like, for example, the Tom Hartman program uh, or any other alternative viewpoints that have been able to thrive and find an audience thanks to the Internet being a level playing field for all. So essentially, you know, this is one of those things where it's disguised as a benefit to consumers, but really it allows the biggest players to win uh, and allows them to pick and choose what voices we hear on the Internet. Now, I read an article, I think it was in the Financial Times last week, about these laws in Oregon, California, uh, Washington State, and uh, other states considering them. Um, some of them just direct the state to not do business with any Internet service provider who engages in any of these, you know, practices. Um, others are, are specifically prohibiting the practices. Um, those that are prohibiting the practices, I, according to this article that I read, uh, will be challenged in federal court uh, by use of the Commerce Clause, saying that the federal government has the ultimate authority to regulate interstate commerce, and it is impossible to do anything on the Internet, even... Uh, if I in Portland, Oregon, sent uh, my producer Sean in Portland, Oregon an email, it's probably going to go through a server in California on the way, and uh, you know, or New York or someplace, and therefore the state cannot regulate Internet service providers because they're participating in interstate commerce. Now, that seems like, frankly, a, a strong argument. I mean, Bobby Kennedy used interstate commerce, uh, a, a very weak thread of interstate commerce, uh, to segregate or to integrate lunch counters in the South in the 1960s, and the and the thing that he used to prove that he could send federal troops in and change the behavior of a locally owned lunch counter was the fact that they were using uh, Heinz ketchup that was made in Pennsylvania, that they were serving you know uh, pickles that were made in in uh, Ohio, and and that was enough. So what do you think? I mean, is this a, is this going to be a challenge that could be successful? So there's definitely going to be some court cases around these state-based laws, you know. And one thing that, that is good about these initiatives is that they're keeping the ISPs busy. They should have to fight this patchwork of laws across the country. They're the ones that created this situation by spending a tremendous amount of money lobbying 
uh, and in court trying to get the, the perfectly good federal net neutrality protections that we had stuck, struck down. So I don't have a lot of sympathy for them having to uh, fight all those battles. Um, but the reality is, you know, there's, there's a number, there's a very strong legal foundation for many of these state-based bills, uh, including the one in California. Um, and, you know, the, one, another issue here is that the FCC, in their order, attempted to essentially ban states from doing things like this. Um, but, you know, the experts, uh, you know, believe there's a real strong course, uh, course uh, case to make in court um, that they, they weren't effective in doing that, that essentially by, you know, giving up the right, um, their own right to protect us from these types of ISP abuses, they therefore kind of uh, abdicated on their right to ban other states or entities from attempting to do it in their stead. Now, uh, beyond the FCC preemption, there's also an interesting thing to look at here, which is that you've probably been hearing, you know, reading op-eds, um, some put out by, you know, groups with nice names, like the Progressive Policy Institute, that keep saying, oh, you know, everyone loves net neutrality, but what we need to get it done with is bipartisan legislation. That's, of course, the, you know, the magic words in Washington, D.C., bipartisan legislation on net neutrality to solve this once and for all. Now, there are bills that have been introduced by uh, Republican Marsha Blackburn from Tennessee uh, and won a companion bill to that introduced by John Kennedy in Louisiana um, that Republican are lovingly also. titled the Open uh, Internet Preservation Act. Um, now, it sounds good on paper, right? But of course, what it does is it actually undermines the FCC's ability to enforce net neutrality protections uh, and would, ban, would legally ban states from doing the types of things that we're seeing in California, Oregon, and Washington. So it's very important to understand this isn't even a weak net neutrality bill or a compromised net neutrality bill. This is an anti-net neutrality bill that's being packaged and sold uh, by the cable companies and, and was likely drafted essentially by telecom lobbyists um, that's attempting to take energy away from the real path forward in Congress, which is for them to use the Congressional Review Act to overturn the FCC's decision and restore net neutrality protections for everyone so that people don't have to move to California if they don't want their cable companies to decide what they can see and do on the Internet. And, and what's the status of that? Now, under the, under the Congressional Review Act, a, the action of an, an administrative agency, an executive branch agency like the Federal Communications Commission, they take an action, in this case, Ajit Pai, the former Verizon lawyer who's the head of the FCC, blowing up net neutrality. That can be undone by Congress passing a resolution of disapproval, basically saying, no, we are the elected representatives of the people, not you, and we disagree with what you did. You must do it this way. We are the lawmakers. Um, and, and I know that you, know, we've, you and I have talked a number of times, we're talking with Evan Greer, a fight, uh, campaign director of fightforthefuture.org. Um, we've talked a number of times about this and, and encouraged people to call their senators in particular, they're members of Congress, 202-225-3121 is the main switchboard for Congress, and, and register that they would, you know, please support a, a Congressional Review Act, basically condemnation of what Ajit Pai at the uh, uh, FCC did, blowing up net neutrality. What's the status of that, and what are, are there deadlines associated with that? Yeah, so this is, again, kind of the primary focus of the fight right now in terms of what you know, if you're sitting at home listening and you say, I care about net neutrality, still, that is the most important thing that you can do is contact your member of Congress, especially if you live in a Republican state, uh, and encourage them to support the CRA resolution that would restore net neutrality protections for everyone. So right now, the way this works, the CRA, unlike a no normal piece of legislation, only requires 51 votes in the Senate, a simple majority in the U.S. Senate to pass. Right now, we've got 50 votes committed. So we have every Democrat, Democrat, every Democrat plus who? Independents plus Susan Collins from Maine. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, and we so thought we'd we get John Kennedy, more. and now he's come out with this. He's the Republican for Louisiana. Now he's come out with this piece of legislation that actually makes the situation worse. Right, which is, and in a mind-boggling twist on that, he's also still saying that he might support the CRA. Well, this, you know, I, I, I don't, I, you'd have to go ask him what, uh, what he's thinking on this. I'm not really sure. Or maybe he's um, just but, taken from the Trump playbook and just, you know, say whatever you think works. It doesn't matter if it's true or not. Well, you know, I can't get in his head on that one. But no. what I can say is that there's, you know, about eight other Republicans that have indicated that they're considering it or are considered likely to potentially vote on it, given the fact that three out of four Republican voters support uh, 
net neutrality in principle, oppose what the FCC just did. Uh, 83% of voters from across the political spectrum, so a lot of these uh, you know, representatives that are considered likely live in you know, purple districts or, or are a Republican in you know, a predominantly blue district. Um, you know, so they, they got to worry about the fact that this is an issue that's overwhelmingly popular with voters from across the political spectrum. It's not like some other issues that are split down the middle. This is one where many of their own base, their own donors, their own people that go out and volunteer for them are going to be like, man, why are you messing up my Internet? Why are you making it so that Comcast, which owns MSNBC, can direct me to MSNBC every time I get on my phone and I don't get to go on Twitter or to Fox News or wherever it is that they may want to go? So, you know, this is an issue that's not partisan outside of Washington, D.C., uh, and that's why it's so important uh, that we actually fight on it, because, you know, this, this is a simple up or down vote on net neutrality. That's what this CRA is, and that's how we need to treat it. And if your member of Congress doesn't support the CRA, uh, they're against net neutrality, and they're not helping us win. Amen. You can, you can find out all about this or fightforthefuture.org, and if you want to call Congress, the number, once again, 202-225 or 224, both of them work, 3121, 202-225-3121. Evan Greer, thank you for being with us, Evan. Thanks for having me back on, Tom. Always great talking with you. We'll be back.